Uh, good morning, everyone. This is the SUS meeting for March 29th. Uh, today, we're going to cover some topics on JavaScript import reflection and also a, a summary of the TC39 plenary that happened last week. Uh, with that, we'll hand it off to Guy, who has some ideas on import reflection. Hi. Uh, so we uh, initiated this discussion uh, itself out of TC39. We presented the uh, import reflection proposal uh, again at the last meeting and uh, based on a, um, a new simplification of the proposal as as representing phases of the uh, loading cycle and we generally got uh, positive feedback on the specification and it's something that we're looking to move towards progression on so uh, we're we're at uh, the stage of getting stage three reviewers for the spec and we would like to be able to propose stage three uh, at some point uh, in, in the coming months. And uh, in order to uh, in order to do that, one of the things that was brought up uh, at TC39 um, was the sort of question about how these module specifications interrelate and how they interrelate with all these different uh, virtualization workflows. And so there's a lot of cross-cutting concerns that we're working through in the modules group meetings. Um, but it's uh, nice to also discuss those with a compartment specific focus. And so I was happy to try and um, engage in more of those discussions here. Uh, and uh, the um, at its at its core, the um, import reflection proposal is a new syntax for uh, importing a module at the source phase, which means that it is compiled. Um, but it has not been linked, the dependencies have not been fetched, and uh, it is a, a, a module in the case of WASM that is compiled and can be used to um, instantiate multiple times. And we have very much the same um, description of modules for JavaScript in the discussions that we've been having around JavaScript virtualization, which is that you have module source and module representing <clears throat> those same two phases. And so our expectation at the moment, the, the expectation would be that the corresponding import reflection for JavaScript would be a, uh, it would be import and then the source keyword and then the identifier that you wanna use for the source. And if you're importing from WebAssembly, you would get the WebAssembly module object. Um, but if you're importing from JavaScript, we should be able to get give back the, the module source object that we're expecting to be able to provide for JavaScript, which again would be that um, compiled, um, but not linked or evaluated and can be still evaluated multiple times. So um, if, if we're potentially going for stage three, what we're gonna do for now is, is basically uh, throw for JavaScript source imports because we don't have them yet. But it would be nice to work towards a place where we know how those are going to come through. Uh, so uh, we have an API for module source within the compartments proposals at the moment. The question is just, you know, is that API something that in its current form we can expect will be able to support uh, import reflection and uh, when we could expect it and, and, and you know, what, what, this, what the process might how, how it might turn out on that um i think there's some really interesting virtualizations that that can allow um and then uh, that it sort of starts to reach into a whole bunch of the layering questions and and the conversation can certainly open up from there but that's that's the overview um nicolo can certainly provide more context and i'm sure carity will have a, a clearer picture of how this fits together with compartments as well if either if you want to um Share any thoughts? That would be great. Yeah, I just want to add that we like during the module modules uh, meetings, we've also discussed about how to split uh, maybe the compartments proposal differently, like to propose some other layering, uh, so that we can find some shared minimal piece that would also be useful for the other proposals. Uh, because, for example, it would make sense to already ship. Uh, for example, module services for JavaScript, even without all the import hooks, uh, even without the import hook already with 
uh, the imperfection proposal or immediately after. So like part of the discussion is also like not only how the proposals fit together, but also what is the like the best uh, way to group them because we're both trying to avoid hard dependencies between proposals and making sure that uh, like even if at any time one proposal gets blocked, like the the remaining parts are still consistent and usable. Yeah, so um, Guy, do you have your slides easily available? Yeah, let me get the link. Uh, I'll, I'll share that now. Okay. Yeah, and you know we're on Zoom, so so uh, you can screen screen share the slides and and talk to them a little bit. The 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 um, the five part pipeline of module processing and how those relate to the um, the proposed syntax, I thought was really very, very elegant um, reconceiving of, of how the, of, of, of the, the larger um, you know, design space of import reflection and how it all can fit together in a very um, smooth manner. Yeah, so uh, Luca put together, and this, this was uh, Nicolo's actual reframing in terms of phases. That this, when we use this um, syntax for the um, for the import, what 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 we're using for this first keyword represents a a phase of the pipeline, uh, and and so in this case, we're we're um, obtaining the module at the source phase which is this fetch and compile phase of the uh, instantiation pipeline. And um, effectively for WebAssembly, that helps us avoid this kind of monstrosity. Um, and I think there's actually a WebAssembly dot um, instantiate uh, streaming that's supposed to be in here as well. Um, uh, that that um, uh, currently you have to do today to load WebAssembly. And so by having something that represents that phase directly, we turn WebAssembly from something that's kind of very, uh, you know, um, unwieldy to kind of uh, analyze or for build tools to understand. And it's it's um, uh, sort of something that's, that's very much not got first class support to something that's very much has a much closer integration with the module system. Um, and uh, so this would work for WASM with our proposal. And then if you're if you're loading a JS file, we're hoping to be able to achieve the same thing. And then we potentially would have other phases, possibly an asset phase and 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 the, the execution and, and linking phase is represents the deferred imports proposal, which is another proposal that's happening at TC39, um, which I'm happy to discuss as well, if there's interested in, in, in discussing that, there's certainly some cross-cutting relations as well, but maybe on a slightly longer timeline for now. Um, Carity, sorry, did you want to say something? No, no, I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was going to ask for the one that you have, the defer or some other example beyond the, the the source only so yeah that's pretty cool yeah it, it's been really nice that instead of you know the, the the risk with all having all of this stuff together is that it over complicates but it's nice when we do find the simplification patterns that that treating everything as this epic that has had that benefit of being able to find the this this the simpler patterns and and hopefully we can do that for um reflection as well um, and and have some good shared simple patterns that can create some some really strong and powerful virtualization primitives that can make virtualization easy uh, and and powerful in JavaScript. And I think there's some really exciting stuff that we can do there. Um, so yeah. On, on the the Watson example that you were showing before, let's see this one. Uh, no, the one that, this one the one that changed. So the in this particular case. The, the the value that you're gonna get there is going to be the, the thing that you call compile stream streaming with it or compile with it, or is it going to be already compiled by the time you get it? Yeah, so that was the correction. Sorry, I didn't mean to put instantiate streaming. The the correction to the slide is compile streaming. 
So it's um, you're getting the compiled source. Uh, so you only compile it once. You can cache the compilation and reuse that compilation for all future um, instances of that module. Okay, so so it, it knows that because you're getting a Watson module, you're gonna get, and you're asking for the source, you're gonna get the compiled version of that. So the value of was Watson will be in that case a a. A compiled WebAssembly module. Okay. Sorry, it's a WebAssembly dot module. Uh, there is some confusion in terms of uh, our wording here because you can think of this as in in our terminology, it's WebAssembly dot source module, but it's called WebAssembly dot module today on the web. So that there is a confusion there, um, but. Yes, WebAssembly.module is a source module. And like even with JavaScript reflection, like in the module source object, I believe browsers could already have, for example, the bytecode store somewhere on the module source object without like instead of just being an object containing a string. Yeah, I think um, one of the, well, first of all, let me you know, endorse the idea that we should just uh, avoid the, the unqualified word module as, as much as possible and always, and, you know, always use adjective module. Um, uh, the source module is, is what, yeah, what we've been using for the result of, of, compiling a module source and and it's the it's it's well named in one regard and misleadingly named in another regard it's well named in that it only contains information derived from the source there's no context information inside the the module inside the source module um, uh, it's misleading in the sense that the source is not recoverable from the source module. Um, the so you know, and and in particular, this was very relevant to us for um, what's going on with with um, with Modable and XS, where they pre-compile their modules during development, and then uh, all that exists in the ROM is the compiled modules. Uh, the source information is purposely dropped. Um, now, of course, in, in WASM, uh, source doesn't mean source text in any case. Um, but uh, let me first of all just bring up immediately sort of what, a concern that I've got that does relate to one of the constraints that we've that in our understanding what a source module is, um, which is in this import reflection proposal. In the full, you know, the full proposal, the um, uh, this is the import reflection is expressed with syntax, and therefore uh, um, it's it's available uh, to any you know. To any get any code that's not um, that that we're not trying to filter out by person, and the source module, uh, fortunately for both JavaScript and for WASM, is completely powerless. It's a immutable, powerless thing that really does just provide information, um, uh, and, and the you know potential to turn into execution, um, but does not itself provide any ability to cause effects. Uh, the concern is that um, whether the WASM module is powerless is not under the control of TC39, it's a separate standard. So I'm uh, first of all worried about how do we, in, in proposing this and in integrating it into the ECMAScript standard, 
what do we, what can, you know, how do we say what constraints we're imposing and to what degree are we just delegating to the WASM spec? Um, and, um, and I'll start there. Parity, you've had your hand up for a while. Is that on this topic or do you, shall we discuss this topic first? Yeah, it, it is on this. Uh, obviously, but I, I wasn't in the meeting last week. I was on vacation, but it, it, it feels to me that I have a gap on how are you going to use that module that you are importing there? And, I, and it's not very clear to me specifically whether or not what Mark is saying is actually what, what this is doing, that the, the source doesn't have any other information about the place where the source was actually fetched from and so on. Yeah, uh, Nicola. Yeah, so first a question for Mark, to better understand his question is uh, like, how does uh, this concern regarding import source uh, giving like arbitrary host objects such as well assembly module, uh, does it also apply to standard imports where hosts could have their own built-in modules and give you any object or is it different and doing to protect uh, in this case in a different way? So that, that's a great question. Um, uh, it's certainly the case that uh, regular imports uh, are resolved by the host, and the host um, is, you know, free. You know, the the free according to the terms of the current spec to provide um, a you know module instance that provides arbitrary I/O objects. Um, the so I and uh, systems like the SES shim the emphasis on shim, um, which are trying to produce the SES security properties. Um, uh, by you know using uh, Crudy's eight magic lines of code trick, uh, and without um, do have to um, for for valuable strings, we still have to uh, scan them for things like um, uh, dynamic import, the, you know the dynamic import expression since they can occur in valuable strings, and for uh, modules, we do have to actually parse and translate to turn modules into a valuable strings in order to feed them into the eight magic lines of code. Um, so I suppose putting that whole picture together, having this particular angle provide access to host provided power should that occur, does not present a danger of a different kind and kind of already falls into the protections that we have to have for import in general. The, I think I'm convinced by that. So I'll, I'll, I'll retract that as a gating concern. Uh, in general, it's, we're, we're trying to um, prevent access to new powers coming in from syntax. But in this case, I suppose the, the argument that we're talking ourselves into is that it's um, providing access to power through a potential access to power through an extension of syntax that already provides access to power. And all the mechanisms for protecting against that would also apply to this extension. Okay, cool. All right, I, I agree with that. Okay, by the way, uh, like when discussing about being for dynamic import syntax for this, 
uh, someone, I think maybe Chris, many months ago, proposed something like import.source, but then we mov moved back to this, uh, like just put in the phase in the options bag so that like, the existing regular expression that the SES stream uses would like not be broken by the new dynamic import syntax. So like we we were trying like we added the new syntax for the static uh, version, but like we uh, ended up not changing the syntax for dynamic import for this reason, I believe. But that was many months ago, so I might be misremembering. Okay, so, so that that does sound like a good argument. I think I do recall that argument being made. Yes, um, to to argue on the other side, the um, if we wanted to be able to statically distinguish the what would be the five different flavors of dynamic import, um, the pseudo property on the import keyword, um, uh, you know, because the import keyword is a keyword. And the and the the properties are pseudo properties. It would be a, a hard static syntactic uh, difference that would reliably um, uh, distinguish them. Whereas, uh, if they're all folded together into just the dynamic import expression based on dynamic parameters, uh, then you can't reliably statically distinguish them. Yeah, except um, that it's a lot, it, it's basically really, really hard to um, easily figure out import.source or similar things. Uh, and I think import.source is not a problem. I think it was more, um, I, I can't remember exactly, but you can do it with a, with a, with a regex, basically. You have to go and, like, uh, and parse the code. Uh, I don't believe that the, I mean, the regex that we're currently using for uh, the dynamic import expression, the price of a regex is um, that it will, um, you know, make errors of, um, in, you know, make errors of inclusion, the errors of, of recognizing things that are not genuine import expressions because they occur in comments or in strings or, or, or whatever. Um, uh, the uh, the imp yeah we the import keyword followed by um, you know po possible white space followed by a dot followed by possible white space followed by an identifier. Um, let's see. You have we have to conservatively we have to make sure that we never miss one. Um, so what do we do for the I think, I think what yeah, I we think do for the, for the import expression is that if there's uh, uh, the beginning of a comment um, or a yeah, possible comment after the import keyword, we already decide that it's unsafe. Uh, we have to use some trick like that to make sure we don't get confused by the ambiguity of when a comment begins and ends. Yes, I checked it recently, I confirmed that it's like that. It's uh, important than either parenthesis or comment. I'm sorry, I could, couldn't quite hear that. Like I, I, I checked the, the and the code like a few days ago, and like it's exactly as remember. It's import followed by either an open parenthesis or by a comment, and the regular okay. sketches of that. Okay, so I think the same rule would work for you know, for dot followed by confusing comment followed by identifier. Yeah, I think yeah. another issue is that or or a current rule, and that's more of a set shim as of today uh, problem, but. Or current rule would not cache the new uh, import dots uh, source, for example. I believe. And again, okay. it's, been, it's been a while. I haven't looked at it. So. Yeah. So so I believe that about the current rule. So um, uh, and and in general, we're we're you know biased towards not breaking the current rule, not requiring SES to be upgraded in order to remain secure. But 
um, you know, that's, that's, we know that there's, that, that that's a trade-off right now. And we're not yet in a position to, to, until we, until we have get intrinsics, we know we're not going to be in a position to maintain the security of um, old CES versions without maintenance. Um, once we have get intrinsics, then at some point we'll, we'll cross that, that bridge, but we haven't done that yet. Um, so if we really, if, if the if the case for doing it with static pseudo properties is strong, and I don't know that it's strong, um, uh, but if it is strong, then I think it's we can certainly weigh the trade trade off with regard to requiring a a security update to uh, to the session. I, I need I need to go back. I analyzed this a little bit uh, closer a few months ago. I need to go back to that and see. Um see what I got because I, I can't, I just can't remember right now. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to just ask again, you know, if, if we see, um, I, I guess if we can, it could start to try to figure out um, how we, we can go about standardizing module source and how this will fit into the picture. I think that would be a really um, good thing to to work on. Um, obviously, um, you know, we need to get Chris's feedback on it. Um, but if we have some plan, then it puts us in a position where when we're discussing stage three, we're not putting ourselves in a position where uh, there's a risk that we don't get a module source for import reflection or that it doesn't quite line up. Um, so I, I suppose it would be really beneficial if we could have some some way to to figure out module source uh, going forward or, or some tentative plan for, for doing that. Yeah, so certainly one, it, we're gonna get lots of modules there. We, we should get regular modules as well. Um, the so I'm, I'm, I'm still back uh, trying to get back into the other previous conversation still have gaps there um so when when it comes to getting this source when you use the source phase when you get that source um in in the case of web assembly you you get that uh web assembly the module which probably eventually will be source module, whatever it is. But once you have that thing, is it important to have information about where this uh, source was fetched or not? And I suspect it is because you're gonna do some linkage at some point, I don't know, if that's accurate or not. And, and how that happened, I, I don't have a good visual indication of but what's going on there. I don't remember the details. Sure, uh, I'll let Nicola take that. Yeah, so like in the previous discussions also with you regarding like specifically the compartments proposals, I think we settled on the fact that the source doesn't have such info and that they're all in the like module instance, which is like what in this, uh, what in this live will be the attach evolution context phase. And like the proposal, I think at some point Guy even considered having both import source for the source phase and import something else for the module instance phase. Uh, and like the, that second, well, the third block in the slide would be where we have that. Uh, like, for example, the URL of the module. Uh, and I believe it's not part of the proposal anymore because like it's not needed for the motivating use case of the proposal, which is was the modules. Okay, so if, you, if I understand it, you get the source, you get something that does not have anything beyond the actual source to compile. You get the instance, you get a, a source plus the context in which the source was provisioned and then you, you can do default behavior at that point and fetch things out of it and dependencies to, uh, to be resolved by the default hooks and so on. How, how does that work for WebAssembly though? 
So for WebAssembly, uh, there is no sense of it having a any kind of context. So you always provide all of the static imports um, uh, directly. So you have to provide for each of the string specifiers that it has static imports to, because WASM doesn't have dynamic imports, that it's all static. You provide the, the corresponding instances of those uh, modules. And um, but when you do import instance, then what, what do you get for work sample? Is that's a, a that's a a, a WebAssembly dot instance. Or no, like wait, if you do import instance of a WASM module, right now we will probably get a module instance object that when imported like does nothing or throws because you cannot import WASM modules directly now. However, if the web platform like evolves the WASM ESM integration that proposes to allow uh, like ESM imports of WASM files, then with this import instance phase, you would get a module that represents like a, mod a module instance object that would work when later imported, like when later evaluated, thanks to the WASM ESM integration. But like right now, an instance, uh, like a MacMathScript module instance of a WASM module, uh, is meaningless because there is no uh, wasm like there is no concept yet that maps a wasm module to some like context based on like its URL or like where it was imported from. Okay, so does that mean that it will throw or, 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 or what will be? So we're we're not specifying the instance import in import reflection. And uh, we're we're only currently specifying the source import. I see, I see. So in the future, we see an extension point where we can have instance once we figure that out. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so the, there can potentially be the extension to that. And once we have the ESM integration for ESM figured out, you could um, then get uh, the same object that you would for JS for the instances, whereas the sources would maybe be distinct objects. Um, yeah, and then this also brushes up against the CSP discussion, which is another thing we're following up around the stage three process. And um, and uh, the for, for CSP, it's a denial at the point of, we were investigating this yesterday, at both at the point of when you First, uh, and Nicola, please correct me if I got this wrong. Um, when you first fetch the module, so it's actually a compile guard. So you have to have permission to compile these bytes. And then again, when you evaluate the module, you must have permission to evaluate. And when we integrate with CSP, uh, currently there is no CSP integration for ASM. So one of the benefits of this proposal is that we can build a CSP integration that's um, part of script source so that you can um, uh, you know, have, have a uh, rule, rule space system to say certain URLs are permitted to provide um, WASM bytes for compilation, others aren't, whereas there currently isn't anything like that for WASM. So that would be able to be gated at the import level, and um, that would be a, a compilation gate um, it could only be an evaluation gate if we do associate some data with the WASM module. And that's something that we're working out at the WebAssembly spec side. Um, and and, See, and that's still under discussion. So, uh, so, so there's, in considering that, the it realize there's, it makes me, reminds me that there's two kinds of source module we should be thinking about from the JavaScript side. Uh, which is the the one that we've been talking about, as well as the virtual source module, the the um, uh, the source module that's just uh, authored behavior to an API that is not derived from compilation of separate sources, uh, and this is already uh, reflected in. Um, uh, the CES shim support for doing CES in environments that limit eval or prohibit eval, where you can uh, 
um, uh, uh, directly uh, provide a the 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 functor that's the sort of the the um, the essential behavioral component of uh, asking a module to evaluate with a set of uh, imports and exports. So the so the problem, the reason I'm, I'm well, first of all, I'm, I'm raising this uh, generally because uh, we should keep our eye on it as part of what it means to um, have a notion of source module that that uh, works for the overall epic. Um, but the other thing is that there's no conflict with regard to CSP inhibition of compilation in the first place, and CSP inhibition of um, whether uh, sources from a particular place are compiled uh, to produce a source module. But once you've got a source module, uh, the issue of um, uh, is it somehow unforgeably tagged with origin information so that you can then do further CSP restrictions on it? Um, uh, well, there's um, the notion of some kind of unforgeable tagging is uh, at odds with um, uh, the notion of our virtual source modules that 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 it's simply an API that you can implement directly without without having compiled it from sources and it can act like um, like a source module. The other thing, of course, is that there are no origins in the TC thirty nine spec. Um, uh, so so let me just pose the question for the. Is there actually a need for CSP controls post compilation? You know, of what you can do with a, um, you know, a source module once it exists, or are the purposes of the CSP eval restrictions all served by preventing the compilation into a source module in the first place? I'm having a, a meeting with. Um with uh, Francis who worked on the CSP specification for WASM hopefully next week. And I would like to follow up on this and report back um, some of those questions for WASM and how those have been understood in, in the WASM ecosystem. Uh, Nicola, you had your hand up briefly there. Was there anything that I got? No, I just want to uh, answer to Mark. So like there is at least one difference between uh, like built-in sources and virtual sources uh, because built-in sources can be like potentially transferred across agents or like across workers ah. like well virtual sources cannot because they like they would probably contain functions. right yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll even go further along and saying that I'm, I'm not at this point, I'm not very convinced that we need a virtual mo virtual sources. We might be able to get away without that. So right now, we are successful using virtual sources uh, in the uh, session, uh, in particular as used by MetaMask, uh, in order to um, uh, in order to turn uh, um, uh, common JS modules into module sources. Right, but since the source doesn't, doesn't connect to another source directly, it goes through an instance, you might very well do the same thing at the instance level. So imagine that rather than creating a, a new instance from a source that you import somehow or that you create using the module source constructor, imagine that you can create a, a module instance that does not have a source, but does have the controls that allow you to define how the namespace object is going to be built. Uh, I, I mean, a module instance already, I, I don't understand that. The, the essential thing about a module source is that it can be instantiated separately 
in, in different compartments with full control by the compartment over um, you know how it gets how it gets instantiated and what it gets hooked up to and what the important namespace you know is. Um, we can do that with the common JS modules by virtue of turning them into virtual virtual source modules. If you turn them directly into module instances, you would have to turn them directly into module instances separately in each compartment because there's commitments that are made when turning it into a module instance that are not made in turning it into a module source. Right, but that should not be that should not be a, a deal breaker. You, you you can still create factors of these module instances per compartment. When you so, what? how does it fit into the compartment API? I don't I don't understand. How does it fit this factory of instances? What is the factory of instances if it's not a virtual module source? So I think the key, the key, let me just reiterate the key here. The key point is that a source does not connect to another source. You need a vehicle to connect sources to get them linked and create instances out of them and link them together and so on. So the source yeah. using it as a vehicle only to share certain information that actually belong to the same realm, but you're sharing that information um, across different compartments. And with that information, you're able to go ahead and create instances that allow you to, that, that has a certain um, mechanism to link different instances together and so on. Okay, but what is the reification of the, um, the information provided um, uh, only by the source such that you can feed that into the compartment API and and uh, instantiate it differently in different compartments. Right. So the, the only the only detail there is that you have to have knowledge about what what kind of instances you are creating when you have the virtual source of, of some kind, then you don't necessarily need that additional information. You just do a creation of an instance um, off of a source, whether that's a source that you import or a source that you build using the virtual source. And that is nicer. But my argument there will be that you still need to have significant knowledge about what this is because you have to provide. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting lost in the pronouns. Who has to have knowledge? The um, Whoever is creating uh, an instance of it, whoever is creating an instance out of a source whether that okay. source is a virtual source or, or a input source, because you need to do the, 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 the linkage of that instance. You need to have uh, information about what you're creating. What is the thing that you're creating so you can build the right input hook or whatever form of linkage you will use. So for okay, those- the, the, I mean, the, the idea, I mean, the division of responsibility as I understand it is that the, um, the common JS virtual, you know, the author of the common JS virtual module mechanism, the thing that turns a common JS source into a common JS virtual source module, uh, he has to know that it's obviously that it's a common JS module, but once the virtual source module is created, then somebody using the compartment API um, uh, doesn't, particularly have to know that that virtual source module represents common JS. It just, it has imports and exports and gets hooked together. Uh, you know, there's certain restrictions that, you know, certain pain points of the, uh, how common, you know, common, common JS um, uh, fits in, but, but except for edge conditions, somebody using the compartment API to, to instantiate and link these virtual source modules does not need to know that they're common JS modules. Yeah, so that that's, uh, that is precisely the point I'm trying to make. It doesn't need to know that it's a common JS, but it needs to know what it is, well, how how to link to other things. Because if the well, source, but I mean, it, but, it, but I mean, it's it's the way it links to other things is except for edge conditions, exactly the same way any other source module links to other things. No, that's 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 my so Mark. That's precisely my point. If I give you two sources, 
whether yeah. they're spiritual or not. And I give it to you. Yeah. How are you going to build the instances out of them without knowing what they are? When you say knowing what they are, I need to know what they import and export. I don't need to know what their source language is. So you, you, you do need to know because if they have if they have a dependency, how do you resolve to the dependency without knowing what that thing is? Because remember, the source doesn't have a, a origin of any kind. It's just a source. So I give two of them to you. What do you do with them to resolve to the import that they have? Both of them has an import x dot js inside them. How do you know how to resolve that then? How is this different from built-in sources? Like even if I have a JavaScript, two JavaScript sources with like import x.js, you still need to like have, yeah, like when building your own books, you still need to know. And that is precisely my point. What I'm trying to say, what the, the, the gist of it is that the source itself is not sufficient. Even if we introduce a virtual source, that is not sufficient. You have to know what you're doing. So you have to know what the per what the purpose of the module is. But I mean, if if the module was one day written in Common JS and another way, another day written in uh, ECMAScript modules, um, uh, that refactor should be mostly invisible to compart to you know code at the compartment level that's manipulating it to. To instantiate, to link and instantiate. Certainly, but because you already had to have some sort of out of band configuration for the thing that you're going to instantiate, you could you could use that out of band sign off to create instances that are tailor made to the source that you want, rather than having to create a virtual source. So the argument that I'm trying to make is against the well, but but the whole but was the you say create the instances the creating I, I I'm really not understanding this the creating of the instances is done by using the compartment API the the what what's fed into the compartment API are module sources or virtual module sources so the 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 person who knows that. This module source represents a common JS module is not the one using the compartment API. It's only the one who um, uh, created the mechanism for turning common JS sources into a virtual source module. Because if it gets refactored, it's only the replacement of that mechanism that happens when it's refactored to change its language. The, the code that's using the compartment API to instantiate and link it should not need to change. So trying to find a different way to explain my mental model here. I see somebody has their hand up. Is there a question that we're not uh, getting to? No, that's, that's probably me. Um, okay. the, I, I feel that the when when it comes to virtualization, or so it feels to me that what, what, what you're what you're trying to achieve is that you do virtualization by using the concept of a so, virtual source as the vehicle to achieve virtualization. Therefore, the the code running inside the the, the compartment doesn't need to know that you're getting a source or a virtual source. It will just use that thing, assuming that it's a source, but it happens to be a virtual source because the virtualization or the hooks that we have at the compartment level will allow us to replace that with the virtual version of what you're trying to import. Yeah, that's that was yes, exactly. That's that's my understanding of what the what the whole point of virtual source modules is. Yes. What I'm trying to argue is that you should be able to achieve um, the same thing without having to rely on a virtual source. You can just use a source who, um, who- Can you get the same separation of concerns? I believe so, because what you're gonna give to them is basically a source whose job is to import from a module that you will resolve and this module is going to be, we can call it a virtual module, but it's not a virtual module, it's actually a module that does not have a source, 
but it has the control that allow you to create the thing that you need. So basically, you it's a, it's a little bit more cumbersome because you have an intermediate module now, but it's just an export uh, export, export after. Oh, oh, an intermediate module. I, okay, now I th I'm starting to see. But you still that means you have to write an intermediate module per foreign language module that you're trying to virtualize. Basically, for every virtual for every virtual module you wanted to create, you have to create an actual intermediate module. Is that what you're saying? Uh, uh, for, for, if, at, at the end of the day, the virtualization is simply going to resolve to a source or some sort, or whether that's a source or not, but that's an existing instance of a module that you want to kind of proxy to it or something like that, you still be able to create an intermediate source that that's what you give to the, the actual uh, um, uh, compartment. So they get a source just like they were getting before. They get a source. It's just that this source, the only thing that it does is re-export everything from another module that you will resolve to. And you provision that module somehow in such a way that this module that you're going to provision is going to define via some APIs what is need, what is it that is it is exporting rather than using a a, the sort as a vehicle to define the export and the import from other modules. Okay, uh, let me let me first of all admit that I'm only half getting this. Uh, cl clearly, I think we need to fo follow up offline to arrive at a mutual understanding. Um, and I apologize that I ran out the time on this one issue when we have other issues that we should have also gotten to. Um, and of course, that we also did not get to any of the TC39 stuff. Um, we do have a next meeting that reuses the same Zoom room. So uh, it's not uh, possible to just let this meeting continue past the, the hour. Yeah, let's, let's shout offline. I think uh, the, the, the only detail is that we, we should probably not hold that strong onto the virtual module. Uh, for preventing other things to be explored um, because there might be a way that we can just do not need to have a virtual module at all. Uh, if we figure that out, then the, the concerns that we have related to the virtual module are not really concerns. Okay, so let's, let's follow up offline. Uh, I would like to follow up on this uh, CSP discussion next week, maybe, if, if that makes sense. Um, I can create an item for that. Um, and yeah, sorry to take up all the time on, on this topic. Uh, I guess maybe if we can make it shorter next week, there could be time for um, wider TC39 discussion as well. Okay, uh, Guy, thank you very much. And yes, I think that uh, bringing, uh, bringing this topic and, and with a focus on the CSP issue, the next meeting would be great. Thanks, everyone, and see you at some point in the future. Bye.